We have a very strong physical constraint. We have to leave the room by five o'clock, <laughs> is it that? Or five past five, I guess? Five o'clock, yeah. So you will be a witness of a rather brutal rationalization exercise. <laughs> I'm going to more or less jump to every third of my slides. Uh, but it will be on the website, so if you want a more thorough uh, discussion of some of the issues, uh, you will uh, get it. Uh, second point, I think this session, usually after coffee, uh, is of the nature that we want to present what sort of longer-term research programs we have in different areas, and you saw one example by Sandra, and you will see another example from uh, my side. In fact, you will see in your, uh, in your folder that we have a rather long list showing that we have done a lot of research on migration, uh, and you're very welcome to uh, look at these publications uh, uh, and, and, and have a look at it. <coughs> these publications are organized by uh, themes, so I'm going to cover only a few uh, of these themes, uh, but uh, there's much more work done. The third introductory remark is you will see that uh, I'm going to combine two issues. One is uh, reviewing a bit of our results on, uh, in terms of migration research. But secondly, uh, one of my main points I want to make is that Europe is going through a regime change of what are going to be long-term scenarios of migration in terms of geographic orientation, in terms of uh, migration policy formulation, but also in terms of um, uh, the pattern uh, and the nature of migration flows. Uh, I am going to substantiate that point, and I think uh, the idea in my presentation was to also get your um, response to which extent migration research has to change in order to really meet the challenge uh, from a policy perspective. So you will see these two parts over here. I start with a very short review of uh, what guided uh, migration research at our institute. And uh, it's, uh, in a sense, quite typical of uh, what uh, guided uh, economic research on migration by many other researchers uh, over the past 10, 15 years. The big theme uh, which uh, my migrant researchers also were asked to uh, look at uh, over the last 10, 15 years was really east-west migration. Uh, the issue of EU enlargement, the, con the connection to uh, candidate countries to foresee in advance what sort of uh, impact even pure quantitative studies on uh, potential migration flows and of course the impact on labor markets. You will see this will be reflected of course in migration research from the Institute. I think you will see that uh, this analysis became quite refined over time because it's not a sort of sharp break before enlargement, after enlargement. There are things happening before there's a lot of differentiation going on across uh, destination countries within the European Union. As you know, they had different transitional arrangements. Uh, they made use of transitional arrangements. These, these themselves had uh, effects of re-channeling uh, 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 migration flows to different countries, where, which also the public was partly surprised by, like the nature of uh, dramatic increases of east-west migration to previously pretty unlikely destination countries like Ireland, the UK, and uh, not so much towards uh, Germany and Austria, which use these transitional periods, etc. So you will see a lot of research went into refining uh, the analysis of migration flows, how migration regimes affected, uh, uh, which themselves sort of evolved through the different stages, these migration flows. The third area which uh, uh, was uh, analyzed and occupied migration researchers is of course the impact on destination countries. Basically, do we see something uh, about uh, a performance of uh, EU uh, countries into which migrant flu uh, moved to? And uh, you will see, for example, some areas where the uh, WOW research did quite a bit of work um, and is continuing to do some work. Uh, the role of migrants in terms of productivity, potentially on innovation, that's ongoing research. Uh, very much uh, a very important aspect of uh, migration flows is the very strong contribution to mobility patterns uh, uh, inside the EU in many dimensions, uh, across regions, across sectors, across occupations. Uh, you will see a very, very significant impact of migrants uh, in those terms. Uh, 
in uh, many of these areas, economists stick out from uh, possibly other researchers in other disciplines, politics, social anthropology, sociology, that economists generally come out with a rather favorable picture on uh, what is the impact of migrants. Uh, I think this could also be one of the weaknesses of economics, <laughs> economists' migration research because we are really not doing much multidisciplinary work uh, to really understand why uh, there is such a discrepancy because uh, between economists' um, analysis of migrants' impact and uh, the general public perception and the political responses to that being uh, uh, quite often uh, much more negative is, I think, because of lack of uh, connections between economic research, cultural, anthropological research, sociological research, etc. Uh, we have done quite a bit of work, which is, of course, in WIW um, uh, speciality, that we are not only interested in destination countries, but we are very interested in the impact on source countries, the areas where uh, the countries where people come from. Uh, we know this literature in development economics, uh, the issue of brain drain, potential skill shortages, uh, the impact on education uh, of people staying home, health effects, remittances effects. And this was quite an interesting area of research for uh, the Vienna Institute because we have this phenomenon inside Europe. So the study of uh, the impact on source countries uh, was one of our concerns. Uh, you will see uh, later on that uh, another area which I think in terms of the aspect of European integration being basically an area of potentially uh, low barriers across uh, European Union, they are not uh, completely disappeared, uh, means of course that what we call new forms of migration mobility uh, are starting to characterize migration flows, return migration, cross-country migration, and in many aspects, we are quite interested that different groups of migrants behave differently in uh, picking up these new forms of migration. My last point on this slide is, of course, uh, already uh, showing the issue in which we have to move towards uh, and uh, which is uh, the new challenge, actually, for research, but also, of course, policymakers, that there is a big, big shift uh, which Europe can expect and it's undergoing, probably the refugee situation now is one of the most striking uh, expressions of that, that we are moving towards a regime which will be much, much more characterized by south-north uh, migration, meaning from non-European uh, Union countries, um, basically in uh, the EU's neighborhood or Europe's neighborhood, uh, characterizing much, much more strongly migration flows in Europe than the very strong concentration in the debate in the past on east-west migration. So I think I have 10 minutes left, probably. Um, I, um, so I think I will really now jump. I, you, I, I cannot go in detail over uh, all the results from our research. I think uh, in terms of this early work on migration flows, I do want to emphasize the interesting features we found in terms of differentiating migration restrictions. Uh, because, and this will be interesting for south-north analyses. Policy regimes are not zero-one uh, uh, regimes, but they follow uh, different patterns. Visa liberalization, use in very differentiated manners, transitional arrangements, of course, access to labor markets, the ease of integration of labor markets. And I think some of our econometric analysis was trying to look at the impact of these different regimes. The important thing, of course, for an area like the EU is there's still a lot of national responsibility, national formulation of these migra migration and mobility regimes. And of course, therefore, there are externality effects of what country, what one country does in relation to other countries. So I put that down here as diversion effects, which we did and uh, tried to estimate and analyze. Um, let me jump to... Uh, uh, well, uh, I mentioned to you the uh, very important contribution by migrants to EU mobility. As you know, uh, economists, or from a macroeconomic point of view, always emphasize the importance of mobility in the labor market uh, as part of, for example, the criteria for uh, a properly functioning monetary uh, union. And we do find very significant contributions of migrants uh, in terms of mobility. A much stronger reaction to business cycle fluctuations in terms of uh, in and out of different uh, 
labor market statuses in employment, out of employment, uh, etc. Uh, in terms of um, interregional, uh, intersectoral mobility, etc. Uh, what is interesting is uh, these mobility patterns uh, affect natives in different manners. For example, just to give an example, we do not find uh, that a net increase of migrants, in, especially in the high skill area, has a negative impact on uh, employment opportunities for uh, native high skill. In fact, they are quite complementary. So we can see when uh, net mobility, net employment creation increases for uh, migrants, it also increases for uh, 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 natives. Um, interesting, uh, which again is probably for us important for the study of potential south-north uh, integration, is that we find quite different impacts of uh, migrants from different source countries. And we look at countries from other advanced EU economies, from uh, new member states, from other European countries outside the uh, European Union, and also from developing countries or other advanced economies. We find quite significant differences, how they affect natives' uh, pattern in terms of uh, activity rates, employment rates, etc. cetera. Uh, interesting, um, we speak a lot about the pressure of skill upgrading uh, in the labor markets of the European Union, but also in Western countries in general, the loss of jobs for uh, low qualified or people with low ed education attainment levels. Um, and therefore, uh, when there's a pickup of growth, there are many more jobs generated in high skill, uh, higher skilled or medium skilled areas, but uh, very little in low skilled areas. There we see a significant difference in behavior for natives and migrants in the se sense that net employment creation is much more even for migrants across different uh, skill uh, groups. An area which is well studied by other uh, researchers on migration is the rather striking feature of uh, skill and job mismatches, meaning that formerly migrants might have quite high educational uh, attainment levels, but they work in jobs which are very much below what one would normally characterize in terms of required education levels. Um, you, you, we, we, have, we have many uh, studies uh, in this area. Uh, we see that this mismatch is also highly sensitive towards business cycle fluctuations, meaning migrants take up even more low occupation or low sk skill required jobs when the economy is going down. So the mismatch gets worse when there's stagnation or contraction in the economy. Again, uh, a feature which is uh, rather um, problematic if we uh, do forward, look, uh, if we look forward in terms of south-north migration patterns, the mismatch in terms of over-education of migrants from developing countries is much greater, significantly greater than migrants from other, uh, from European uh, countries. We see also quite striking differences across countries which have different labor market organization. Uh, for example, in Sweden, Denmark, countries which have very high levels of general education and skill, uh, a very strong uh, element of uh, relatively well-educated in formal terms, occupying low occupation jobs. In the UK, we know a rather differently organized labor market, uh, much less uh, evidence for qualification job mismatches. Austria shows pretty strong qualification mismatches in the service sector. Uh, so I jump again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another interesting area uh, of research was survey work, which we did sometimes in collaboration with uh, people in other countries, like in the UK, where we compared uh, the integration experiences of uh, migrants uh, in many, many different dimensions. These were uh, rather um, highly uh, elaborate uh, questionnaires uh, of Polish migrants in the UK. Romanian migrants in Italy, and Serb migrants in Austria. One of the interesting results is uh, what leads to uh, uh, different forms of migration plans. Uh, and by this, uh, we analyze in particular whether people, uh, whether uh, more mobility is encouraged or discouraged by a stricter or more liberalized uh, uh, migration regime, and basically the, re uh, the result which uh, we find is as 
uh, labor market access gets liberalized, intuitively plausible, uh, people opt more for uh, fluid mobility patterns, meaning they are more open to return migration, to back and forth uh, mobility patterns, etc. So as uh, a migration regime becomes less restrictive, uh, there is more footloose uh, movements. This is particularly strong for highly educated or high-skilled segment of the migrant workers. So if we think in terms of retaining uh, high-skilled uh, migrants, uh, these are, this is very sensitive in a liberalized regime, so there will be more competition for talent uh, as the migration regime becomes less restrictive. Of course, the integration experience matters a lot, so these cross-country analysis of positive or negative experiences with integration, um, the type of dynamics of uh, getting a job which, is appro which the migrants themselves see, are appropriate, see as appropriate for their skills is important as a decision to stay or not to stay. Again, very important for higher skilled workers. Um, let me move to uh, in which direction our research should move or is moving now. Well, I think in the current climate, it's very important to also look at the differentiation between, is there a difference between refugee behavior, refugee integration processes as compared to migrants? And I think one thing which is rarely done in migration research is to follow the same migrants and refugees over a longer period of time because we don't just need a snapshot of mismatches or what is the position of uh, a migrant in terms of uh, a point of time to really judge uh, migration policies, integration policies, other policies, how they affect uh, labor markets, one really has to follow that over time. This is, for example, one of our applications to national bank research money <laughs> to follow uh, uh, a panel of uh, refugees and migrants over a period of time. The other area, of course, is very important to move further to an analyze uh, what happens uh, beyond the border in terms of integration policies, how, uh, and again, the differentiation between of different groups of heterogeneous migrants from different places with different skills, with different uh, attributes, uh, and how they uh, are being affected. And finally, of course, there is uh, the relationship to, um, uh, which, of course, in the current refugee situation is to which extent bilateral, multilateral uh, agreements with non-EU countries affect the characteristics of migration, who comes, who doesn't come, who, how can one encourage uh, some of them, how does it affect the source countries themselves, how is it combined with other policies than migration policies per se, such as aid, development policies, uh, connectivity <laughs> in other spheres. Now, uh, let me very shortly go through, um, uh, through uh, the migration challenge, which is basically uh, a policy part of the discussion I wanted to initiate. Uh, first, this point about the big shift of migration flows, east, west, to south, north. Probably I'm not going to tell you anything new about it, but it is obvious that we are um, in a situation where there is a dramatic demographic complementarity between the neighborhood of Europe and uh, the European situation. You know, aging processes versus uh, a surrounding uh, belt of countries um, uh, from which are uh, source countries or potential source countries where the demography operates very differently. So if you look at demographic forecasts, which are pretty robust because we know how uh, we, uh, we know with birth rates, uh, with age cohorts, how they move through time, you can see, uh, just to give a few numbers, the MENA countries, which are only the region of the Middle East and Northern Africa, not looking at Africa as a whole, which are obviously uh, neighboring source countries, population moving from about 300 million in the early 2000s to about 537 million uh, in 2050, about an 80 percentage uh, point increase. EU population in the same period would fall from about 500 million to 430 million. If you focus on the labor force, meaning the group of uh, in the population, which is potentially the workforce. Um, this decline of the population in the EU is in almost entirely people of the potential labor force by about 70 million, uh, while the MENA countries uh, labor force would increase by a period of, uh, by um, a number of about 115 million. If you go further to Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, simply looking at a very narrow age group from which we know most 
uh, uh, young, uh, most migrants or refugees would come from is an increase of uh, 330 million over that uh, period. But of course, demography is not everything. We are surrounded by um, a region where in fact uh, one of the rather worrying uh, aspects of European development uh, is uh, the rather insignificant impact it had of stabilizing economies, leading to a growth process and a political uh, stabilization process uh, in its neighborhood. It did a pretty good job of countries which joined the European Union, but uh, it failed um, or probably didn't put any resources in it or didn't formulate policies or executed them in terms of uh, uh, reducing uh, the likelihood of development failures. And of course, there are new phenomena which we're going to witness over the next decades, climate change, refugees. We, have, uh, we are going through a period where the neighborhood is really the play ball of geostrategic uh, conflicts, uh, uh, reflecting the change in the global situation. Uh, we have technological changes, as we are, you're quite f uh, aware, the importance of communications technology, uh, which uh, does uh, have an impact on migration flows. And um, uh, there is an interesting phenomenon that uh, it's not necessarily the case when, income, uh, uh, when incomes grow in uh, poor countries that there would be an automatic de decline in uh, migration propensity. In fact, the research by uh, many people shows that initially, uh, as income growth increases, uh, migrants uh, can uh, cover their migration costs more easily, and in fact, there's an increase in that. So uh, finally, of course, we have not seen the evolution of the, of the EU as an effective actor in economic and political stabilization of the region. Why is the EU finding it so difficult to formulate uh, a migration refugee policy? Well, like in many other areas of, for of policy formulation in the EU, uh, there is basically a lot of fragmentation, fractionalization uh, uh, within uh, the European Union. Part of it is an historical, a historically grown experience of uh, migration and migration policy uh, formulation, which goes back a long time. In fact, we heard a very long uh, uh, time um, dimension in Peter Nolan's discussion, but of course, uh, colonial links are very differentiated. Some countries had it, some countries didn't have it. Uh, the regionalist focus on uh, source and destination countries is very different, like Austria with the Balkans. We also are ill-equipped, except for some countries, to really see the nature of south-north migration as compared to east-west migration, uh, Austria case in point. The differentiation is uh, also quite striking in terms of the switchover of countries uh, in terms of uh, immigration, emigration uh, uh, histories. Another, probably, which I find a very important issue, we cannot solve the issue of joint uh, migration policy without also tackling the issue of integration, because it is an, the basically a two-step uh, situation. When you have a national responsibility for dealing with the integration process, which it is, there are very few resources or um, uh, put at in terms of a joint uh, policy on integration, again reflecting the different levels of, uh, of, uh, of uh, support, uh, workings of labor markets, housing markets, etc. So if you don't have integration or joint responsibility for integration, it's very difficult to think there would be um, a joint uh, evolution of uh, refugee policy. I think I'm going to come to my uh, last two slides, if I one two minutes, yeah? Okay. <laughs> uh, well, there are many inconsistencies which are, of course, contributing uh, to um, uh, evolution of um, uh, EU migration refugee policy. Uh, we have open borders in Schengen, but we are speaking about quota allocation of refugees. We have national migration policies, but we have free uh, mobility of labor. So it is pretty sure or clear that what is required is some degree of harmonization. There are some moves in this direction. Uh, they have to become partly a domain of EU harmon uh, harmonized schemes, learning from best practices, some standards being set. I think an issue which I'm pretty sure will evolve, just like you have in many other areas, uh, like the macroeconomic imbalances procedure, it's going to be a monitoring of 
different countries' performance in terms of integration. So integration reports are going to become one of the vehicles of uh, trying to learn from best practices, also to impose some degree of peer pressure, etc. cetera. Uh, on, in terms of WIW research, um, I think some of the research will be worth uh, using and could uh, cover uh, what we uh, are going to see in terms of South North, uh, uh, South North uh, migration, our analysis of mobility, on impact of productivity, skill mismatches, etc. The important thing about uh, the evolution of migration regimes, migration policies, the effect of integration policies on migration patterns, etc. However, we will also put a lot of uh, attention to see whether there is a differentiated performance, differentiated experience with South-North uh, flows. We will analyze, hopefully, uh, in uh, a sort of panel analysis, uh, the integration process of refugees as compared to other migrants. And we will analyze uh, uh, the impact of policy initiatives, uh, the differentiated experimental field of the European Union to have different integration policies and mechanisms and what one can learn from their impact. And of course, the other area which is highly unexplored in terms of impact is what sort of bilateral, multilateral agreements uh, will be taking place with this rather problematic neighborhood of the EU. I'll stop here. Thank you.